Hey guys, quick question. Have you ever had a situation where someone tells you a fact and you're like, Psh, no way that happened, but they're all, no, it actually did, and you're all, no, really, stop lying to me. And this situation escalates really quickly to the point that you begin to question that relationship with the person who told you, and now you're minus one person in your life thanks to your own stubbornness? No? Well, get ready anyway, because here's some history facts that sound fake, but actually aren't. Times were tough during the First World War and all hands were on deck for military equipment. For example, take a look at this German passenger cruise liner. Seems innocent enough, maybe take the family for a nice vacay, but wait, slap a few huge guns on it and you've got yourself a formidable fortress of war and that's exactly what happened to the SS Cap Trafalgar in 1914. She was stationed off of the coast of Brazil doing uh, German war things I guess, when the crew developed a dastardly plan. See, Germans of course were not the only ones to think of converting cruise liners into warships. Great Britain had their own HMS Carmania, strapped to the keel with enough guns to make an American's pants feel tighter than usual. Well, the German crew decided to set up a trap for the British Navy by disguising their ship as the Carmania, giving it a fresh coat of paint and flying under the British flag. What the Germans didn't know about the Carmania was that it was stationed near Bermuda, north of where they were. The British knew Germans were doing some evil German war things off the coast of South America somewhere and went to sniff around. After a while, they spotted what they thought was another British ocean liner turned warship. Hang on a tick, said the captain. It's my ship, but but it's, it's over there. How, how can it be here too? The captain did a double take to his own ship and then back to the other liner. Once everything clicked into place, the Carmania pursued the imposter. Ironically enough, the Germans were the ones who were taken by surprise and were like, Oh fuck. And so they started to scurry, but then decided to do a 180 and engage the Carmania herself. After two hours of back and forth gunfire, the Cap Trafalgar was sunk by the very ship it disguised itself as. As I'm sure you know, World War II ended with the bombings of Japanese cities Nagasaki and Hiroshima using one of history's most devastating weapons, the atomic bomb. Even though Japan was one of the Axis powers and thus an aggressor during the war, the events were still truly tragic, as the vast majority of over 100,000 lives lost were innocent civilians, men, women, and children. Single bombs were able to level entire cities in seconds using unprecedented power. So you'd be pretty unlucky if you were smack dab in the middle of both of those bombings. And that's exactly what happened to Tsutomu Yamaguchi. At age 29, he had spent the last three months in Hiroshima on a business trip and was about to head home. On the morning of August 6, 1945, he was walking out of his company's shipyard when he heard the American bomber overhead and noticed that it had dropped a small object attached to a parachute. Mr. Yamaguchi witnessed the blinding flash and was able to dive out into a nearby ditch. The shockwave ripped him from the ground and tossed him several feet in the air backward. Suffering severe burns and ruptured eardrums, he spent the night in an air raid shelter and was able to catch a train to his hometown the next day. His hometown of Nagasaki. After being treated in the hospital and going home, the absolute mad lad went to work the next day. His boss demanded an explanation for what happened in Hiroshima. When Mr. Yamaguchi discussed the bomb, his manager called him crazy since a single bomb couldn't wipe out an entire city. Well, what did it look like, asked the manager. Mr. Yamaguchi looked out of his office to see another blinding flash of light. Well, something like that. The second atomic bomb devastated the city of Nagasaki, but fortunately left Mr. Yamaguchi relatively unscathed, and in the coming years he would become a spokesperson against nuclear weapons. He was officially recognized by the Japanese government as the only Niju Hibaksha, or twice bombed person, though it is believed that as many as 165 people survived both bombings. If you're unaware, Alexander was pretty great. You don't get that title for nothing. At age 20, he was made king of his home country of Macedonia after his father kicked the bucket from an infectious disease called being stabbed with a knife. Once he assumed the throne, Alexander was all, well, time to conquer everything, I guess. And so he did, beginning with his daddy's dream of kicking the ever-loving shit out of Persia. He then moved on to the Middle East and then Asia where, yeah, he conquered that too, declaring himself king of Asia. This started to go to his head a little bit because he started to develop a god complex. He named many newly found cities after himself and even stamped his own face on the money. He thought of himself as a divine being because of all of his triumphs. 
Which, like, rightly so, I mean, whenever I get a sub-30 and a 16-star Super Mario 64 speedrun, I'm like, yeah, I'm the best. Across 11 years of conquering the lands, Alexander never lost a single major battle. But no matter how strong, notorious, or determined you are, you can't beat death. In 323 BC, at age 32, Alexander started to feel a tad ill. After suffering 12 days of excruciating pain, he passed away. Or so everyone thought. The weird thing was that once he was declared dead, his body showed no signs of decomposition for over six whole days, which played into theories of his divinity. But since divine beings don't exist, ooh, hot take, modern day scientists now believe that Alexander the Great may have suffered from Giabure syndrome, a rare disorder in which your immune system attacks your nerves. As a result, it is likely that Alex was fully paralyzed, but still very much alive, which explains why his body did not decompose. So, you know, when he's being buried for being like totally dead, he might have been completely conscious and aware during the entire burial. And that's worse than a sleep paralysis demon. The continent of Africa was an absolute free-for-all in the 1800s. Although there were many established civilizations and cultures, Europeans had a different idea. Britain, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain were ever so gently colonizing every speck of land they came across on the African continent. The British Empire had a grand plan of colonizing the entire eastern seaboard, which included one particular island nation, Zanzibar. Sounds good, right? Well, not to the German Empire, no sir. So, after Zanzibar's pro-Britain sultan decided to suddenly die under mysterious and poisonous circumstances, it was time for someone else to take the throne. The British Empire had previously declared that only a sultan with the British seal of approval could assume the throne. Well, some new guy decided to seize the throne for himself. He was the previous sultan's cousin and was in no way responsible for the previous sultan's poisoning. Nope. No way involved. So, being the new sultan, he told the British to go touch sand. As you can imagine, the British Empire did not take this too well, so they offered the new sultan an ultimatum. Surrender the throne, or get completely wiped off the map. Ha! Huh, you and what army? said the sultan. But it wasn't an army, it was a navy. The British Navy, with four heavily armed navy gunships all coincidentally pointed directly at the sultan's tough and durable wooden palace. The British instructed the Sultan to relinquish the throne by 9 a.m. that morning. Sultan believed this to be an empty threat and refused to back down. I told you guys, Britain was never going to- at 9.02, the Navy warships opened fire on the palace, reducing it to rubble almost instantly. At 9.40 a.m., the British guns fell silent. The Sultan was able to flee the palace in all the chaos and went into hiding, seeking refuge in a nearby German consulate. The palace completely surrendered, ending the war in just 38 minutes. By the end, 500 palace defenders perished with only one British sailor being injured. The British assigned a new Sultan that afternoon and all was well. Well, as well as it could be. Now, before I introduce our last fact, I'm gonna ask you to promise me to be a little bit more mature, okay? All right. Come on, guys, I said be mature. You'd figure finding everything on our own planet would occur first before the exploration of our heavens, but that's not the case. Which I suppose makes sense since Uranus is bigger than Antarctica. Truth is, the celestial bodies above have been known for millennia. Obviously, the sun and the moon are hard to miss, but our ancestors were aware of our neighboring planets of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and even Saturn as far back as the second millennium BC. It would be a few thousand years before the seventh planet, Uranus, was formally discovered in 1781. So, while dumb nerds were exploring the skies, huge dorks were still exploring our own planet, filling in the blank edges of the map. Take a look at this map. This was drawn in 1570, depicting the theorized land of Antarctica, back then referred to as Terra Australis, literally meaning southern land in Latin. Notice how Australia hasn't even been formally discovered yet, and how South America be lacking. Over the coming centuries, these land masses would be more accurately surveyed and marked. Along the southern tip of Chile, things got Chile. 
Sailors in the area noted extra strong winds and dense ice fields which deterred further exploration. Since the borders of South America were now fully discovered, there wasn't much reason to continue into treacherous waters anyway. Well, not until 1820, where an expedition from the Russian Empire traveled beyond the wintry waves. Larger and larger ice shelves had been previously discovered, but of course, a man with a silly name would discover mainland Antarctica, just three days before the British sighted the frozen continent on an expedition of their own. Sucks to suck. Well, there you go. What'd you think? Glad to hear. If you would like to hear more history facts, check this video out. If you don't, uh, alright, I won't stop you. <laughs>